What a glorious hope we have in you, and what a wonderful thought that we now, because of you, will sing your praises for all eternity. That is an immeasurable gift, and we are so grateful. Lord, now as we open your word together, I pray that we would have humble, soft hearts before you to hear and to live in response of who you are and what you have done in this great gospel that we have just sung of and rejoiced in. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Please be seated and open up your Bible to the book of Colossians. Turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Today we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 7. Last week we saw that the believer's resurrection with Christ and severance from the world must drive the believer to pursue things above, heavenly things. If you're a Christian, you have been united with Christ in his death. Your old man, your old self has died and you have been united with Christ in his resurrection. Your new man or your new self has been raised up with Christ. The Christian, though once dead in their transgressions, as Paul said in chapter 2, verse 13 of Colossians, has also, as he said in the same verse, been made alive together with Christ. The Christian is no longer under the reign of sin. The Christian is no longer enslaved to sin. And Paul now, while he has been fortifying the believers in Colossae regarding the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ, is imploring them to cling to Christ's all-sufficient work in salvation, and now is shifting into the practical implications of what the resurrected life in Christ is to look like in practice. Paul is giving instruction to be in practice what the believer is now positionally. The believer is in Christ, and he, Christ, sets the standard for how we are supposed to live. We are to walk in him. But what does that look like practically if we are to live the resurrected life, if we are going to live for heaven, if we are to set our minds on things that are above? What will that produce? And Paul's going to get into that as we walk through chapter 3 together. He's going to lay that out for us. But Paul starts with the reality that we have to actually deal with what remains of our sinfulness, and we must do so in a decisive, active, and consistent manner. But thankfully, as Paul has spelled out so clearly thus far in the book of Colossians, dealing with sin that must happen, this dealing with sin that must happen in the believer's life is not to appease God's wrath. It's not to atone for our sins. It's not to merit righteousness before God. It's not to raise ourselves up, but rather it is an appropriate response to being saved by his grace. This is the appropriate response to live in the new life that Christ has given to us and to walk in the power that he has granted to us as we live for his glory and to live for the glory of God. To live for God's glory in our daily lives is an immense privilege and should be the passion of every Christian. So read with me starting in verse 5 of chapter 3 and we're going to... Work through verse 11. Paul says this, starting in verse 5 of chapter 3. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, 
barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. The believer's new self, being united with Christ, demands an end to the old self's way of living. The believer's new self, being united with Christ, demands an end to the old self's way of living. The believer's union with Christ in his death and resurrection calls for an end to the old self's way of living. And as Paul says in verse 9, the old self with its evil practices was laid aside and the new self has been put on. What Paul is describing here is salvation, and in light of that work of God in the Christian's life, the old pre-salvation way of living for this world is to be cast aside, done away with, in light of the believer's new life in Christ. And why in the world would we act as if we were still in the grave when we have been raised up with Christ? At the moment of salvation, the believer is unified with Christ in his death and in his resurrection, and the call for the Christian is to live in accordance to this new life that he possesses in Christ. The believer's new self being united with Christ demands an end to the old self's way of living, and Paul is going to highlight three ways the old self lived that must be done away with, and it's important to note that these old ways of living that Paul is pointing out We are to have a disposition against those things as well as all sins. So he spells out three ways that we are to respond to old ways of living or or that we are to put off our old way of living. But in so doing, this is how we really should respond to all sin. Yet in our passage, he's going to highlight three various categories. And we would do well to keep that in mind as we work through these specific instructions. And so Paul gives for us a call to put to death or put aside various sinful practices. And the believer's new self, being united with Christ, demands an end to the old self's way of living. The first demand or instruction that Paul gives pertaining to the old self's old practices is this. It's the call to put to death sensual sins. Put to death, put to death sensual sins. The believer's new self, being united with Christ, is to put to death using your members for selfish sensuality. We see this in verses 5 through 7. Now look at the first half of verse 5 again. Paul says, Therefore, consider the members of your earthy, earthly body as dead. Paul again starts this section with the word, therefore, pointing back to the believer's union with Christ. And then he says, consider as dead your members. The members. And the ESV does, I believe, a better job with this verb here in the original and translates it put to death. Put to death. The King James says mortify. And in this command is the demand for decisive action to be taken immediately. There is urgency and immediacy in this command. Paul is saying, deal drastically with sin in your life. Deal dramatically with the parts of your body that have a propensity to sin with the members of your earthly body. And the call is to mortify these things, to put them to death. There is to be a serious disposition against these things. There's to be a serious disposition against sin in the believer's life. There's to be an intolerance of and hostility towards sin in your life. And it seems that often we can apply this urgency and intolerance towards sin well in others' lives and find it much more difficult to bring the same sense of urgency to sin in our own lives. And that's the call here. It is to put to death using the members of your earthly body for sinful things. God's work in the gospel, the fact we have been forgiven all of our transgressions, should never make us comfortable with or complacent with continuing in sin, but it must cause us to run as far from sin as possible to put it to death. Our disposition towards sin isn't the kind of disposition where we leave a light on in the house and we'll be sure to turn it off next time we pass by. 
This is your house is on fire and you need to extinguish it now. Put to death sin now. And then Paul lists here five sins of a sensual or sexual nature. And Paul lists five sins we must put to death. And these are all related as he's going to move from the more explicit outward action to the heart. He starts with first immorality. And this is explicit, unlawful, intimate actions. It is illicit intimacy with another. This is actively relating to that which is intended for marital intimacy outside of the marriage relationship. And then is added impurity. This is what is unclean in a moral sense. It is broader than the word immorality, but it denotes immoral conduct. And then you see the next in the list there, in keeping with the same topic, Paul says passion. This is strong emotion of desire or craving. This is a drive that does not subside until satisfied. Next is evil desire. This is lust created in the mind. It is an overwhelming craving, a desire of the mind for evil. And then Paul says greed. This is a desire to have more. This is an insatiableness or covetousness. And look at what Paul adds to greed. He says, which amounts to idolatry. When you're working through this list, you might think at first that greed seems out of place with this list, but it's absolutely not. And it really narrows in at the heart of these immoral sins that are to be put to death. These sensual desires act like so many other sins and that there is a, a reality that what you indulge in today will be less satisfying tomorrow. Thus, the craving for more, the greed of the heart to be satisfied leads you deeper and deeper into sin and this greed which amounts to idolatry is to be put away with as there becomes an all-consuming desire for more in terms of impure, sinful experiences. And now, your life is no longer dominated by being fixed on things above, but it is woefully dominated by selfful, selfish, willful indulgence and in sinful things pertaining to your old self. And Paul's command here is to put it to death, to mortify this sin in your life. From the most active outward display to the secret, impure desire of the heart for more. Put it to death. It's far too easy to be tolerant of our sin. To keep impurity close and convince ourselves that we can keep this sin in our box of what we think is okay or tolerable. To think, oh, we won't go this far. We'll keep it in this realm. To think I will indulge on my terms rather than ridding myself of it. We deceive ourselves thinking we can master sin in this way. We can have it on our terms. We can control it. And that's just not how sin works. It entangles. It deceives. It presses on. It destroys it promises what it never delivers. And if you think you can allow sin in your heart, in your mind, and you think you can expose yourself to sin with your eyes and convince yourself that you would never act on those things, you have already lost the battle. You're right where sin wants you. From the most flagrant outward action to the slightest moment of impurity in the heart, it is an offense to a holy God worthy of his righteous judgment and wrath, and we must kill it. Decisive, immediate action. We need to put this sin to death in our lives. In this list, Paul starts with the individual expression of these sins and narrows into the single impulse from which these sins arise, and he says, mortify it. 
This is so informative for us. It's so helpful as we fight sin in our lives. It's easy to look at the external action and only try to battle the external actions with external means. And in one sense, to battle the external action is good, but it's not all that we should do. It's not all that is necessary. It's not far enough. We must address not only the acts or expressions, but we must mortify the root of greed in our hearts, of discontentment, of idolatry. That is, the things of our hearts that are not spiritual things, but earthly things that are sinful, selfish indulgence. There needs to not only be hostility to put it to death, of the external actions, but we must have that same hostility towards the internal actions and thoughts of our hearts. And then look at verse 6. Paul says, For it is because of these things the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Paul gives a reason here for this demand or instruction to put this into death. And Paul is saying, because of these sins, the wrath of God will come, or more literally is coming. A motivator for taking radical steps to eradicate these sins is the reality that God's wrath abides on those who are not his, who practice such things. Don't live like those that God's wrath abides on and Then there's a a phrase in the NASB where it says, upon the sons of disobedience. And there's question as to the genuineness of this phrase in the original. Some manuscripts include it and some do not. The ESV does not include this phrase. And it parallels Paul's statement in Ephesians 5, 6. And whether or not you include the phrase here, the point is clear, whether it is included or not, that God's wrath rests on the unbeliever who lives in perpetual opposition to God and practices such things. Which should be a sobering motivator for each one of us to put to death this sin and to walk in the newness of life that he has granted to us to not continue on in our old self's way of living. And then look at verse 7. Paul reminds the Colossians of a humbling and sweet reality. He says, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Paul reminds the Colossians that their old self used to walk in these sins. The pattern of their life was one of being dominated by these things as they lived in them before Christ. And again, this should motivate and drive the Christian to put to death those sins that once characterized the rebellion against God and called for the wrath of God to rest upon them. This wrath doesn't remain any longer for the believer. What a wonderful thought. There is no longer condemnation, and what a wonderful reality this is. And so don't play with and live in the sin that God has rescued you from. In light of your new self being united with Christ, put to death the old self's way of living as you once walked in these sensual sins. Now put them to death as you walk in Christ. So the believer's new self being united with Christ demands an end to the old self's way of living. The first way of living that the believer is to put an end to was the sensual sins. And next, number two, is the command to put aside fleshly responses. To put aside fleshly responses. Look at verse 8. Paul says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. He makes a turn from reminding the Colossians of what they used to be to what is to be true of them now. They are called to put aside all of these things, and then he gives another list of five sins or five vices pertaining to a social nature, particularly how we respond towards others. And he says, put them all aside. These old self kind of responses, these fleshly responses, put them aside. This is similar to putting to death. It is to put off or give up or renounce. And again, there's a sense of urgency, a a call for immediate obedience. In the first list of five sins, Paul worked from the outward action to the issue of the heart. Here he works the other direction, 
He starts with the issue internally of anger and then ends with the outward manifestation in abusive speech. So let's work through these lists, this list here. Now, the first thing the believer is to put aside is anger. This is internal churning. This comes from unresolved internal conflicts that fester and grow bitterness in the heart. It is a smoldering within. This isn't brought about by external circumstances, but it is true within a person. And external circumstances or offenses merely give occasion for what is true inwardly to erupt This is the kind of person who is perpetually walking around on edge. And the issue isn't so much what's going on around them. The issue is what is going on within them. This isn't only responding to moments with anger, but this is an angry person. And this is not fitting for the Christian. The the Christian is not to be a loose cannon. The Christian is to be dominated by peace, not a perpetual smoldering within the next fleshly response is wrath where anger is a fleshly disposition of internal churning wrath is the outward expression of this it is more of an outburst of anger or a angry temper and then paul says malice this is maliciousness malice is bent on doing harm to another it is to bring about evil or harm against someone else And then fourthly, he says, slander, he's getting more specific in the expression of these fleshly responses as this is abusive language. It's where we derive our word blasphemy from, and when directed at a person, it is speech that defames. And then lastly, Paul says, abusive speech from your mouth. This is evil or obscene or derogatory speech that is intended to hurt someone. This is a lashing out for the intended purpose of bringing harm to another. And all of these are to be set aside. The anger in our heart, the outbursts of anger, the biting hurtful words that come out of our mouths, we are to put those things aside. How are you doing with this? Are you quick to set it aside when you see it in your life to turn from it? Or do you, are you drawn more to, to rationalize, explain, justify it away? These things are to be cast off. They're to have no place in the life of the new believer, the, the new man of the believer. Paul working from external to internal in the list in verse 5, and then internal to external demonstrates that the root in both of these lists is one of selfishness and self-focus. Greed in verse 5 and then anger in verse 8 demonstrate a lack of a heaven-directed orientation for our thinking and thus a key means of grace for us. For deliverance from these things is found in our thoughts. And motivations. This is helpful for us when dealing with sin in our life to address what is true of our heart in our moments of sin that we might actively kill sin as we are intentionally setting our minds on things above as Paul directed in the first part of chapter 3. So the believer's new self being united with Christ demands an end to the old self's way of living The first way of living that the believer is to put an end to was sensual sins. Number two is the command to put aside fleshly responses. And then lastly, number three, we are to put an end to deceiving one another. Put an end to deceiving one another. Paul in verse 9 gives a very direct command for for, forbidding the practice of lying to one another. Do you see that there in verse 9? Do not lie to one another. This word for lie is not confined only, it's not confined only to uttering falsehoods, but it's deceptive actions as well. Paul in this word is not only forbidding deceitful words, but also deceitful lifestyle. And then look at what he says next in verse 10. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self. And when Paul says, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, 
He's describing the change brought about at the time of repentance and faith. This occurred at salvation, and this work at salvation is the grounds upon which this command is expected to be obeyed. Since you are in view of the fact you cast aside the old life or have died with Christ and have put on the new self, have been raised up with Christ, we ought to no longer live a double life, lying to our brothers and sisters in Christ. The old self's power has been stripped away, and though it may harass you, though it may shout at you, though it might demand things of you or even woo you to sin, it can no longer compel you to sin. Praise God for that. You're not a slave of it any longer. You can now lay aside what once perpetually laid hold of you. Where deception and lying to others for selfish motives and self-preservation used to be the norm, now in Christ we are no longer to lie or deceive each other. We speak what is true. We represent ourselves accurately. Why? Well, in light of the new self who is being renewed, this renewal is an ongoing, continual renewal, an ongoing transformation into a true knowledge. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And this renewal, it's a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. This renewal is an ongoing continual renewing, an ongoing transformation into a true knowledge of God. God is continually moving the believer into this fullness, this true knowledge that is found in Christ alone. And if you remember, Paul has already made clear that all wisdom and knowledge is found in Christ, and this true knowledge is according to the image of the one who created him. What does this all mean? What is Paul getting at here? He's saying as one whose former self has died and has been raised up, with, raised up with Christ to a new self, God is bringing about a renewal in true knowledge, which is a continual conformity to Christ's likeness. Meaning we actively kill sin, we set it aside actively and address not only the outward actions but the inward happenings of our hearts that are sinful, and we know that it is God's work growing us into deeper conformity into Christ's likeness. These realities don't detract from each other or compete with each other, but they complement each other perfectly and are God's design for the Christian living their new life for Christ, the resurrected life. We press on in active intentional obedience, taking drastic measures to live holy lives, and yet it's not us, but it's Christ in us. And so we have hope. As we wrap up this morning, Paul says this renewal is one where there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man. This is a a corporate nature, there is a corporate nature of the new self where all of the racial, religious, cultural, and social distinctions that are perpetually present in the unredeemed system of things, they are obliterated, they cease to exist in a separating manner, in a distinctive manner, that is, those distinctions don't carry weight They're obliterated and cease to exist in the new self, in the new man. This is a renewal, and this renewal is an indiscriminate renewal as we are all united in Christ. Everything about the Christian life is summed up in Christ. Christ That is true individually for us, and that is true corporately for us as well. Do you see that at the end of verse 11? What a wonderful, precious statement. But Christ is all and in all. This is an emphatic way of stating that Christ is the sum and substance of the believer's life 
and Christ indwells the believer. What a precious truth for us to lean on, to remember, to know as fact. As we press on seeking holiness for the glory of God, to live in light of the work that God has accomplished in his son, once again for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we, in consideration of our old self, our old way of living, are just overwhelmed. God, we need to be overwhelmed all the more with the depths and riches of your grace that you would save us, that you would grant to us a righteousness not our own that we could never attain, that you would give it to us as a free gift in love, And then not only that, but that you would unify yourself with us. That you would be all that you would be in us. So that as we seek to live in light of this new self that you have created, that we can have hope to walk in accordance with your work as your power is what has brought about our salvation and your power is what enables our obedience. So help us to actively and intentionally pursue what is right before you and to actively and intentionally put to death and lay aside all that remains of sin in our lives. We need your help. This is a a joy and a privilege that we would be called and be granted the ability to walk in holiness of life. Help us to do so. We ask in Christ's name, amen.